before before this you meeting is being oh, recorded it's okay um before we move on with our presentation i just wanted to also point out this qr code if you uh would join us in making a pit stop recommendation list of restaurants or food trucks around our Pacific Northwest. Um, we are doing that in celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month as well. Um, and this survey link, uh, Noemi, do you think you can pr put that in the chat as well? Yes, let me just look it up and I'll put it in the chat. Thank you. So I will begin our presentation of uh, um, <clears throat> Lenguaje and Latinidad. So I chose the name Lenguaje instead of language to start this title because to me, um, the word in Spanish has so much more obvious connection to our tongue as this super powerful muscle that connects our brain's thoughts to the people around us. And then Latinidad is my current reluctant preference for the name of our community. Um, the October 6th Lunch and Learn will investigate and unpack this and other names for our group of people. Um, language in the Americas would have been a less problematic name, but we had already sent out all the reminders and announcements. And I think that complexness, that imperfectness is a perfect example of how complicated our people are. Um, so moving on to the maps that you see on the right hand side there, uh, sh these maps show some of the different conflicting borders of how people categorize our hemisphere. Some have a middle or a central America, and some will include Colombia and Venezuela as that middle and not South America. Also on this fourth map, um, we see that Quebec is not included in Anglo America. Um, and I can't quite make out what is supposed to be that light yellow, maybe, maybe in Latin America, but <clears throat> As we will see here, um, Quebec isn't the only part of Canada that kind of doesn't fit in Anglo America because Canada has almost as many Spanish speakers as Brazil, but we definitely don't think of Canada as Hispanic the same way that some in the United States would think of Brazil, even though Portuguese is not a Spanish language. The other point on this map that called, like, jumped out to me as uh, my stepdad is Filipino was that the Philippines wasn't highlighted at all. And knowing that there were centuries of Spanish influence and colonization in the Philippines, I'm sure there are still more people speaking Spanish there and the internet suggested that is true. Um, so that's where I got that. It was an abc.net number, that 0 0.05. Um, the reason I'm assuming that whoever made this map did not include the Philippines was because of the 1987 Filipino constitution that made Tagalog and I believe English possibly the official languages of the Philippines. So Spanish is no longer one of their official languages. But before 1987, were the Philippines Hispanic? So looking more focused on what is Hispanic and Latino, the Oxford Dictionary defines Latino as a person who comes from Latin America or whose family came from there. And Hispanic is of or connected with Spain or Spanish speaking countries, especially those of Latin America. The especially of Latin America or that that con connection in both of these definitions, <clears throat> excuse me, that 
connection to Latin America, to me, it, it makes it more obvious how both of these terms are, were made by the United States government census bureau to categorize our group. These terms weren't from Latino or Hispanic people trying to identify and celebrate ourselves. They are racializing categories for census purposes, as we will go into more detail on in the October 6th Lunch and Learn. Before we can answer the question of what is Latin America then, as the first slide showed, those borders are in, are not, are up for debate. Before we try to identify Latin America, let's just look at the Latinidad or the Latinness of South America. And we're just gonna assume that we all agree that Venezuela and Colombia are in South America for this next two slides. So the yellow country uh, in this map is pa Paraguay, uh, which has Spanish and Guarani, an indigenous language as their two constitutionally recognized official languages. Bolivia has Spanish, Quechua, Aymara, Guarani, and 33 other indigenous languages as their official languages since 2009. But things get even more complicated. Oh, and also, sorry. Can we even say that, so those native languages are not Latin, but also French, I mean, sorry, English and Dutch are not derived from Latin. So we can't, even if we just take out the indigenous element, which is a, a bit, repeating of the colonizing issue. Um, even if we ignore that, we can't say South America is Lat Latino through and through because of the Dutch and English speaking parts of it. Focusing in on those indigenous languages, we see that they are um, not eradicated. People still speak indigenous languages in South America. Um, and some of these languages were even able to expand their um, geographic spread in spite of and through Spanish conquest, sometimes because they were um, a means of resistance. It's a lot easier to plan uh, against your captors if they can't understand what you're saying, what your plan is. But then other times these languages were spread by the proselytizing of the Bible being translated into one language and then that one being shared with other communities that would be more familiar with say Quechua than Spanish at that time. This is another slide I pulled from the October 6th presentation, but this time I'm going to do that Estadounidense sin of showing the entire hemisphere of the Americas, but only talking about one American country. So there has never been a federal official US language. 31 states have adopted legislation granting English official status, but status, but usually it doesn't spec the state wouldn't specify which kind of English, say British or American. Illinois, between 1923 and 1969, recognized American as its official language. Hawaii was the first state to recognize a language other than English. They, since 1949, have recognized English and Indigenous Hawaiian as uh, their official state languages. And the last state I'm going to mention on this slide is Alaska, which in 1998 failed to make English their official language. And then on January 21st of 2015, the state added at least 20 indigenous languages on top of English to be the state's official set of languages. So next we are going to open up the, the floor 
um, and ask if anyone is willing to share what languages you use and what languages did you grow up hearing? And people can either use the chat and I can read things from the chat or you can raise your hand and I'll let Sedona know. Roberto Cordero, who I know has his hand up. And then, so we'll hear from Roberto and then we'll, I'll call the next person with their hands up. Good afternoon, everybody. Yes, I am Roberto Cordero. Uh, I've been speaking English daily for about 21 years now, but still Spanish is the language my mom taught me. That's how I first learned to speak. And like, for example, when I'm alone at, the, at home with my cat, I talk to him in Spanish, even though he doesn't probably care what I say when I talk to him in English or Spanish or whatever. Yes, yeah, Spanish is still my primary language. Thank you for sharing. Luisa, did you want to share? Sure, thank you. Yeah, I had the opportunity to um, grow up in Hawaii, um, just moved to Washington three years ago. So I'm originally from Colombia, so we spoke Spanish in the household, but I grew up with a pidgin English. I grew up with Hawaiian, Portuguese, Korean, Filipino, Japanese, Portuguese, a combination of languages that people needed to learn in order to communicate with each other. So it was, yeah, an amalgamation of a lot of different languages. And that was the fun part about growing up in Hawaii is just this special language that we have and we can speak with each other. So I'm gonna call the next couple of people. And after that, I'll read uh, the many, many comments in the chat. So then we have Maria Laura and then followed by Alicia. And Maria Laura, you're muted. Ah. Como siempre. Buenas tardes. Eh, yo soy Mara Laura Muso, eh, soy de Argentina. Eh, bueno, yo me he criado en las provincias. Nosotros en Argentina tenemos muchos acentos y diferentemente de las tribus que vivían ahí, eh, nosotros aprendíamos y mezclábamos eh, las palabras de nuestros ancestros porque mucha gente son de Europa. Entonces nuestro argentino, como nosotros hacemos el el castellano, decimos en Argentina, está muy mezclado con palabras eh, de italianos o franceses y también de la gente que trabajaba en nuestras casas o las partes rurales, con la parte de Quicho e Inca. Y bueno, eh, yo a pesar de que vivo, he vivido más tiempo acá en los Estados Unidos, mantengo el acento argentino, hablo rápido, así que me estoy conteniendo. Es un honor hablar con todos ustedes. Ahora, otra cosita. Eh, nosotros en Argentina, nosotros nos consideramos que es un continente americano. Nosotros llamamos a la gente de Estados Unidos, estadounidense, no americano. Muchas gracias y un honor hablar con ustedes. Um, so for those of you who may not be fluent in Spanish, I'm just going to briefly translate uh what Maria Laura said. So Maria Laura is from Argentina. She has a muy porteño acento. Uh, and she was talking that in Argentina, because of the heritage of the people, there are a lot of uh, European words. And she also talked a little bit about geographic differences in Argentina and how Argentina feels that they're Americans because they're in the Americas and that they refer to the United States as estadounidenses, just like Sedona was telling us earlier. And uh, we'll hear now from Alicia. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much again for having us, having me here. And yeah, no, I grew up um, uh, with the Spanish uh, at my house, but also um, I remember um, my sister, well, um, one of my sisters, she was married and, and the uh, husband was from Haiti. And for some reason, like I hear her also talking, um, uh, the language that they speak there and the place, that, uh, the area that he was born is called Patois. I don't know if you ever heard of that. Uh -huh. That is a combination, I think, French and the dialect that they speak there. And so I hear her talking and I say, wow. But at home, but it was like because she has a husband and they, you know, talk the language. She learned really quick and the <laughs> mother, you know, was surprised when she was talking Patois and she's like, she understand everything I'm saying, what? <laughs> but, you know, mainly in Venezuela, um, 
our language is majority is Spanish. Um, our accent too is different depending on the region that you live. Uh, I'm from Caracas, Venezuela, and people that I'm from Maracaibo speak different, a little bit uh, different dialect, and the same with uh, the island, Margarita Island, or people that like, sometimes I can't even hear what they're saying because they're so fast that you cannot get any word out of it. But mainly we speak Spanish and we do take English second language in college. Uh, but we have movies in, with closed caption, everything is completely Spanish. Thank you all. Glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you, Alicia. So I'm going to read out. I'm going to read the comments and we have a very uh, multilingual audience today, which is wonderful. This is one of the goals that we had. So Lisa Malden says that uh, they speak Spanish and Portuguese. Rosanne Morales, English and Spanish. Monica Corral, I speak Mandarin with friends who know it, Spanish at home and English at work. Rebecca Cortez, Spanish and English. Carolyn Bruchot, and I might be mispronouncing your last name, my apologies, French. Uh, Beck Moraz it speaks uh, Yupik in Western Alaska. Christian Carvajal, I speak entirely English. My dad actively discouraged us from learning or speaking Spanish as he feared it would limit our opportunity in Los Angeles. And, you know, Christian, many people in my family have had that same experience. It's an experience that many folks of our heritage and other immigrant heritage uh, who have, uh, you know, gone through that, unfortunately, have been discouraged because of uh, ideas about uh, the place of Latinos in our culture. So I, I, I understand and share that. Uh, Paola Gonzalez says Spanish and English. Uh, Vania Berg says Samoan and English. Indira Santiago says I use Spanish and English, but grew up only hearing Spanish. Aaron Sando says English. Byron Welch, Portuguese and Spanish. Jovita Ramirez, Spanish, Spanglish and English. Yay, go Spanglish. Samuel Torres, uh, English and Spanish. Doug Mora, we heard a lot of Spanglish, but we were encouraged to focus on English. Kara Beth Stevenson, I speak English, I grew up hearing. Uh, Delia Arce, English and Spanish and half and half. Indira Melgarejo, I use Spanish and English. I grew up hearing only Spanish. Ana Toledo, English and Spanish. Tremaine Jenkins, English, grew up speaking, grew up hearing Spanish, Russian. Cynthia Overby, Spanish and English. Mary Garcia, Spanish and English, parent from Texas and descendants from Spain and Mexico. Manta, uh, and I'm probably going to mispronounce her name, so I apologize. Manta Oyuwa Nijan. And again, I'm sorry about that. Uh, in my home, my parents spoke to us in Hindi and we answered in English. That's also a very common immigrant experience. My parents would talk to me in Spanish and we talk back in English. Uh, Diana Renteria, my dog's first language was Spanish and all his commands are in Spanish. Yay! My doggy only knows one word in Spanish and that's is vengo, which means come, and most of the time he ignores that. Uh, Sarah Imolda says Arabic, Span, English, and Spanish. Angela Furchild, I speak English, but grew up hearing a lot of Spanish among other families and learning it in school here in New Mexico. And I spent part of the year in New Mexico too, so yes. Uh, Laura Cardona says English, Spanish, and Italian. Grew up hearing at home Spanish and Italian. Amy Nichols, I grew up speaking English at home, Spanish and French in school, and I am learning and sometimes hearing Samish. Uh, and then uh, spoke uh, the, the name of the people's tribes, but I cannot pronounce that, so I'm sorry. Uh, the language of uh, uh, their mom's ancestors. Carrie Beth Stevenson, I speak English. I grew up in South Texas hearing German and Spanish. Yoli Chileni says, Barrio is Spanish. Yay. Herminia Esqueda, my parents were both Tejanos. We spoke to my mom in Spanish. We spoke to my dad in Spanish. We spoke to each other in Spanglish. Ay Pacheco, Spanish, English, and Chamorro. Uh, Brian Welsh, Aguante, Argentina. Mazozi Nienda, I am from Malawi and my parents speak three languages, so I grew up hearing, and I'm probably going to mispronounce these, I apologize, Chichewa, Tumbuka, English. Plus, I spent eight years in Turkey, so Turkish has been part of my life too. 
Carla Lopez Wilkinson, in my home, we were spoken to in Spanish, required to answer in English and fluent in Tex-Mex because it's mainly made up when a Spanish word is unknown or an extra word is unknown. For example, yardita for yard or carro for car. Um, and then there's a couple of people thanking the speakers. Olivia Smith says, my first language was Spanish. My parents are Hispanic and French. I understand and speak Spanish, English as well. Deborah Nutson, English in my home. I heard a lot of Spanish in my childhood friend's home. Cynthia Cartwright, Spanish and English. Deja Powell, my family were English speakers, but I grew up in a heavily populated Pacific Islander population on the west side of Salt Lake City. So I heard a lot of Samoan growing up. Michael Briones, my parents were born in Jalisco. My mother's also from Jalisco, Mexico. They migrated to the US in the 1970s. My first language is Spanish. And now as an adult, I mostly speak English. Herminia adds to her previous statement, my mother-in-law who was born in Mexico lived with us for 20 years until she was 100 years old. My kids grew up speaking to her in Spanish and English to us. Um, a couple of other reactions to some of the speakers. Julia Ferrer says, in my home, my siblings and I spoke to both in Spanish and English and respond in English only. And I just noticed that there's 41 messages. So I'm going to have to stop now. But this is so exciting that all of you are doing. Sorry, I cannot read everything, but this is amazing. Before we go back to Sedona, I see that Francisco Uribe has their hand up. Francisco. Well, actually, uh, for me, seeing this is, is kind of like a, amazing. But also, you know, I came here in 2014 with no English at all. And now I'm working for the state, uh, but also I'm being a, as a church planter in my community. And I work with people from Mexico, in all over Central America, which is so fun because, you know, we think that, well, we, yes, we speak Spanish, but when we, you know, really sit down and speak a little bit, you found how inside of the Hispanic uh, language, we have so many expressions or uh, I don't know how, how say the, 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 the exact word, but the meanings, you know, they can sound the same, but the meaning is totally different. And it's fun for me, at least, because as a pastor, you see, you know, the people had the high expectations and for common words that come from my mouth, that for me, it has no meaning at all. You know, like a bad words or things for them. It's like offensive. It's like, a, man, no, you need to see my heart because that's not what I meant. And the same way, you know, when they speak to me and say things like, whoops, that's like a heavy, heavy word. And it's something that they use in the common day. You know, that's, that's kind of like a, the, the beauty of the language. Yes. Thank you, Francisco. And we will touch upon at the end about some words that have different meanings depending on which uh, ethnic heritage or uh, country of origin uh, people might be. So thank you. And back to Sedona. Yeah, great foreshadowing comment there. I, I really like it. Um, and before I move to the next slide, I wanted to stress um, a point that um, was shared that I hadn't been able to find the time to put into the presentation itself. Um, but that is that absolutely Spanish or Spanglish, sorry, Spanglish and other Creole languages, languages that are made by combining more than one other language together to make a blend. Those are absolutely valid like languages within themselves as well. And um, I think that moving forward in the decades to come, Spanglish is gonna be a, only more and more prevalent and important in this country and this hemisphere as um, you know things go. So I'm really glad that some of y'all mentioned Spanglish um, as a language in itself. So um, is there a language that you would like to practice and what makes it hard or difficult to do that? Also, um, if you're comfortable to share any emotions that this discussion has brought up in you, I invite you to do that as well in the chat or raise your hand. Erica Marie, do you wanna unmute? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay, so I know you guys didn't have a chance to read mine. So I'm originally from Puerto Rico. My mom and dad are from there. My dad is still there. Uh, my mom is here. She moved here when I was a baby. Um, and we spoke primarily English, but we spoke quite a bit of Spanish as well until my mom remarried to, to a Caucasian man. And so we just kind of took it out of the whole lesson in life. And then, of course, when I would go visit my dad, I just picked it up so quickly. And then moving into my adult life, I got married and my husband speaks fluently English and Spanish from Mexico. His parents are too. And my struggle is I mainly, I can understand the Puerto Rican Spanish. Like there's different dialects, but I struggle with replying because when I'm around certain people, which we were just talking about, that huge barrier that we have is different meanings for different words. And I remember as when I first met my husband, I met his mom and I, I don't remember how I said it, but I said soda in Spanish and it was something completely different. And her face got red and she just walked away and he's like, you're not supposed to say that. And I was like, what was that? And it ended up being something very inappropriate. And I didn't know that because it was just how I was taught. And some of the things that if I were to translate it into English is very inappropriate as well to some cultures too. So that was my huge struggle and I cannot roll my R's for the life of me, but I have been taking courses at the college to try and get better at it because I do have two children. I have a eight month old and a, an eight year old. So I definitely want them to be more cultured and aware. And that's what made me want to join this too. But it was such a struggle to feel confident and be like, yep, I said what I said and that's it. So that's where I would like to practice is to be more fluent. And I know that a lot of people on this group or in this organization are able to speak fluently. And it makes me feel so much better that everyone that I've came into contact with have been so supportive, like, no, 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 it's okay. This is how you pronounce it. This is how you say it. And I love that so much that everyone's able to not make me feel weird, <laughs> but feel better and more confident in me even trying, and I appreciate that so much. Wonderful, thank you so much for sharing, yeah. And and yeah, like, especially if we didn't, we weren't able to read your message out, please feel free to uh, volunteer to answer the previous question now if you're not comfortable with these questions, absolutely. Uh, Felipe, did you wanna unmute yourself? Sure, hi, thank you. Um... I'm a new state employee, and I'm originally from Mexico City. I went to elementary school and middle school there, and I'm very grateful that I had the opportunity to learn Spanish grammar and also learn about Mexican culture, and it makes me really sad and upset to hear about all these awful experiences that folks and their parents had, discouraging them from speaking Spanish, which is another European language. <laughs> That's the kind of ironic part. Um, and I noticed that not a lot of folks mention indigenous languages. I would really like to learn at least one indigenous language. I've studied six different European languages, and it's so much easier to do that um, than, you know, to study like Mixteco or Nahuatl or Maya, <laughs> even though those languages have, some of them have millions of speakers. Uh, yeah, and I also want to want to give a shout out for the people who said that the, the people around them uh, discouraged them from speaking Spanish because it wasn't good enough and it's like oh you're either too mexican or Mexi not mexican enough and i'm sorry i'm using mexican instead of you know all these different cultures but um yeah just whatever whatever way you express your identity is good enough you know you don't need to try to fit somebody else's standards absolutely thank you so much and yeah like like i said on the first slide the language is like the name for the category is always going to be hard to find the right fit. So whatever language you use, we understand the intent behind it is 
the main thing. And yeah, what you what you said was was very. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Um, Amy, would you like to unmute yourself now? Um, Heishka, uh, Siam. Uh, hello, and well, first, thank you, and then hello, uh, honorable and like familiar people. Um, my name is Amy Nichols. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a member of the Barrett family of the Samish Nation. And um, I wanted to echo what Felipe was saying about learning Indigenous languages. Um, so unfortunately, the speakers of my family's language, which is uh, we consider them to have gone to sleep. Um, so there's no uh, currently alive native speakers, but um, there's like writing and there's similar dialects that are still alive. Um, and we also have this belief that like language can come back to community. And so we don't say that it's a dead language. We say that it's sleeping until people can be raised with it. Um, and I wanted to echo that sentiment of um, it's really difficult to learn indigenous languages because like, I don't think they're considered valuable from the societal perspective in the same way that like European languages are. So like I grew up, I had access to a bilingual program in school for Spanish and then I was able to learn French um, it, through school, but there was never an opportunity to learn more from my community or from my speakers in that kind of structured way. And so, um, and, and because people will still tell me, oh, like, that's such a sentimental thing, why, but like, it's not practical, you know? Um, and so I kind of, I wanted to talk about it because it's important to me that I've like, as an adult started making more of an intention to learn it and practice it, even if I just hold on to like one or two words um, and like also encourage other people to like, like there's so much that comes from like language, even if you only know one or two words and it's okay to use them and it's okay to be corrected and it's okay. Like, so I, I would love to see um, like better instruction for indigenous languages um, or just like more investment uh, in communities for recognizing their importance. And, and um, I think, what makes it hard is not always having other people to talk with um, because it wasn't a written language, but those are the main kind of, <laughs> you know, tools I have available to learn. So uh, thank you for asking the question. Thank you so much for sharing that perspective. Yeah. the And like the Hawaiian ex, uh, example of the way that native Hawaiian is now being taught in schools is like, gives some hope that it can be raised from its sleep um, as well. Like that, that's very, that's a very important um, perspective to share. Thank you. Maria Laura, Laura, sorry. Would you like to speak next? I'm not, I don't think sí, lo que quería decir es que desafortunadamente. I heard you briefly there, but you, you muted again. Okay. There you go. So, yeah, I just want to refer to how strict the Spanish language it is, because any time that we, and in comparison with English and other languages, uh, the Spanish language we are following the Royal Academy and every time that we're going to incorporate new words, um, it, it takes a tribunal to do so. And historically, uh, the Royal Academy never allowed it to incorporate uh, words from other indigenous languages. They were very opposite. Right now, it's a big change. And furthermore, the other challenges that we have with the Spanish language is that there's the feminine, masculine, and transgender language are not incorporated into the actual translation of Spanish. So there is a lot of stuff going more forward. And furthermore, um, in references, what they were saying about uh, sometimes we mention words that in 
different region of Spanish means different and for other regions might be offensive or a bad word, I think that we, we can find a bigger room for learning and don't feel that anymore. Because if we don't try to break those walls or regional walls, we're never gonna learn. And we get a challenge that some more language become sleeping. And I have learned so much for all the speakers sharing. That was a very, very good program. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that the mentioning of the Spanish um, academy or tribunal is is very interesting. Thank you. And yeah, it really goes to show how the indigenous languages do not have the same infrastructure for spreading. And but also, I don't know if they want to have that same level of like there's some higher power that decides what is and is not going to be added to the language the same way. So very interesting. Thank you. Cheryl, do you want to unmute yourself? Oh, I can't hear you, but it does say that you're unmuted. Still no. Oh dear. You hear me now? Yes. Yay. Okay. That's good. <laughs> okay. um, so I'm originally from Colombia. I've been in the state of Washington for two years. And uh, something that helped me a lot. Uh, learning the different, um, not dialects, um, expressions from different countries, especially for the Central America, Latin America, is working with the community. I've been working with um, the health environment for 15 years and also uh, with the uh, hospitals and the community for that long. So when someone said any word, always I ask them exactly the meaning. And when I say any word that the people doesn't understand, I always explain the meaning. So it's going to have a better communication. Also, it's something um, easy for uh, us to use as a community workers or health workers or the state workers to use um, an Spanish, um, neutral Spanish, like everybody can understand. Easy for us to communicate and for another people to understand. So it's something that I want to give my opinion helps a lot and like um, someone said before we, we don't need to be afraid to ask people um, exactly the meaning so we can learn each other and have a better expression and communication thank you thank you Lisa do you want to unmute yourself now sure thank you can, can you hear me yes hola from Arizona I actually live in Washington State. I work for the Department of Ecology. My parents are out of town, so I am house and dog sitting. Uh, but my parents, I, I love language, and I love to hear that all these different languages are being explored and, and uh, practice and learn. I think I, I put in the, the conversation that my father speaks seven languages. He was born in Germany. And my mother speaks, she, she's Hispanic, uh, Latina, and she has, we've done genealogy and there's so much background on that, but they used to call me a Mexicrout <laughs> because I was half Mexican, half German, uh, more, more other Spanish, but, uh, you know, my, I grew around my, my parents, anytime we had to travel anywhere, they always encouraged us and well, my father made me, but he it would make us uh, learn some kind of phrase or some kind of word or anything in that language of whatever country we were going to. And I still remember Greek phrases, you know, phrases from uh, France, Italy, wherever we were. In my, my parents both spoke German and Spanish fluently, so they would speak that at the table. Growing up, my mother, my grandmother was she didn't want to be seen as Mexican or uh, Latina, Hispanic. So it wasn't really spoken a lot in the household, but my mother 
you know, carried on the tradition. She learned it and she passed it on to me. And so I'm just really excited to see all these people with so many different language experiences. I love language. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you very much. I um, wanted to share, for, I'm not able to read all of the chats and listen to people talk, um, but I saw that Jessica Gant, I sorry if I pronounced that wrong, um, shared being someone who was also actively discouraged not to speak Spanish to avoid prejudice not speaking Spanish well brings up feelings of not belonging to the community, brings up feelings from growing up of being teased by my cousins for not being Mexican enough, et cetera. And I definitely relate to that as well. So thank you for sharing um, the both of the person who spoke out loud and Jessica as well, and everyone else who I haven't been able to read. Um, I had seen someone with their hand up, but they just took it down. So is anyone uh, wanting to share um, as I scan through to various chats? Erminia uh, repeats that same similar thought as by saying another barrier is the shame and ridicule within our own community slash families when we don't speak Spanish to their standards. Uh, Yoli, would you like to unmute yourself? Thank you for raising your hand. Uh, yes, and I see video, you can see me as well. Okay, there we are. I, I just wanted to share something in regards to um, speaking the language, right? So I, I grew up in Mexico, so Spanish is my first language. Um, joined the military uh, shortly after I became of age in, in, in the US. And I, I, I guess I always had this um, self-conscious, you know, type of feeling in ensuring that, um, that I spoke the English language in a way where uh, I could be seen, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Even though my, my, I guess my looks would say otherwise, right? It's like Mexican or European or what have you. But I think for me, it became more uh, relevant when um, I witnessed a, uh, a fellow co-worker in the military of Korean descent who had very, very heavy accent and often quite difficult to understand, uh, but yet a very intelligent, very smart individual in seeing that often they would not be asked to participate in tasks that that person could easily surpass and provide a good, you know, uh, um, uh, product. Um, I became a little more self-conscious of like ensuring that I would get rid of my accent, that I would have the best pronunciation and, and things of that nature to the point where I'm finding myself also um, missing and losing out on my Spanish language and forgetting words, right? So it's, it's become uh, a me uh, type of concern where uh, now, where do I fit, <laughs> you know, because of language, because of an accent, because of how we choose to, you know, express ourselves in a professional setting or, or who we are working around and, and do they see you as fully capable and competent or are they dismissing you because you have an accent and they just don't want to bother with like, oh, what is that person saying? Or what are, what, you know, can you repeat yourself or that sort of thing. So uh, when it comes to languages and practicing and, you know, it, I don't know, it, it does become so challenging, emotionally draining, right? Because we're, we're seeking to, to, to figure out like, okay, where do, are we going to be accepted? Are we going to feel like long and and that sort of thing so I just wanted to share just that experience with with the group thank you thank you so much yeah that's a great uh I mean not great but it's it's a very important perspective to share thank you <laughs> um from the chat I wanted to share Beck Moras's um sorry if I pronounced either of your names wrong, um comment which was that they want to learn American sign and Spanish 
it's hard to learn new, lang new things with so many work and care responsibilities, feelings of sorrow for our past and joy that we can still learn together. And yeah, that's a great point as far as not only American Sign Language, but there's like a specific American Sign Language used by Black people in this country. And then there's a different like vernacular of sign language in Mexico and wherever else around the world. So sign language is an absolutely uh, great language to try to learn whichever variety of it you have access to. Thank you for that comment. Francisco, did you wanna unmute yourself next? Yes, I just wanna share that, uh, you know, I put it in the, in, the, in the chat about something that we, achieve with uh, working with the school district, or not working with the school district, but having a relationship with the superintendent, we 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 get uh, um, the opportunity to have Spanish from kindergarten to above, because we was talking about how hard it is to get a second language when you are in high school, 16 years old, with your, you know, all the hormones, all the changes in your life, and making like a big decisions, and now learn a second language. Well, that's a little challenging. And then we, we, we help him to understand the importance of being bilingual. And, um, and I want to encourage everybody, you know, to, if you have kids, if you have the opportunity to be involved with the uh, school districts, to bring that ideas. And they mostly are open to do it. And, you know, obviously, if, if uh, I don't want to be offensive, but sometimes in the lower levels of, the, of, of our communities, the people don't like or don't understand the importances of being bilingual. But when you talk with somebody that is already educated in, 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 um, and they had the opportunity to um, see the, 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 how many doors are open just because you are able to communicate well with different, com with, with different countries, uh, or with, with different people you know, around the world, they will immediately embrace the idea. And that's how we saw that happening in the Kalama School District. And yeah, now we have since kids since kindergarten. They started in 2019 with the all the COVID thing, but they started the program and now it's running really well. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, thank you. Yeah, and yeah, I Hi. could not keep I, up with the. Hello. Hi. Yeah, I didn't know how to uh, contribute. I, I I called in, so I didn't know how to. I don't have access to the chat. I just. My name is Michael, and um, I love this this call. Thank you so much. Uh, everyone's contributions is fantastic. Um, I wanted to encourage people learning Spanish. Uh, but there's a lot of opportunities. I grew up in Washington State, Spokane, Washington, um, but I spent a number of years in Colombia learning Spanish. And ahorita hablo muy bien, pero no, no es perfecto, pero tengo tengo mucha experiencia. Um, tal la idioma, eh, hablar con gente y también uh, la mejor forma de aprender la, el idioma es vivir con la gente, vivir y hablar y disfrutar con gente. Y no, no tenía mucho clase de español, Ten, tenía dos, dos años clase de español en Florida, pero no vale la pena. Tenía que vivir la, con la gente. Um, Tenía que tener experiencias con gente y, no sé, es, es posible aprender idiomas después, uh, um, después de la línea. <laughs> gracias, muchas gracias por todo. Thank you. Um, I wanted to share one last comment from the chat. Lisa Malden says that they will put Spanish language on Netflix, etc for children's shows when the grandkids are over. And I too will do this where I'll have the show in Spanish, but then I'll have the English subtitles on so that I can try to practice that way. Um, so that's, that's one option. So this next slide, I wanted us to have a little, have it be open to the floor as well, but because of time, I'm not going to do that. Um, so uh, Noemi, did you wanna go through these different regional words of Spanish 
I am happy to do that. And uh, because I also want to respect everybody's time, I'm putting the attendance link again. Only about half of the people that were here did the attendance link. Please go ahead and do it. We really appreciate you doing that because that helps us with tracking the success of our programs for the BRG. So we uh, came up together with some of the words. We're not going to have time to talk about them. But one of my absolute favorite words in the Spanish language which is the word guagua. So if you uh, grew up in the East Coast or the Caribbean, you know that guagua is what folks there call a bus, you know, an un autobus. And the reason why it's called uh, a guagua is because that is the onomatopoeia. So that means the spelling of a sound of a doggy going woof, woof, but in Spanish in some parts it's guagua because when the bus would pull up into your small town in the Caribbean, the all the doggies would make noises. So that's why the bus is called a guagua. Uh, we have others, but I'm going to focus on coche and carro, uh, which uh, one of them, they're both, depending on where you are, coche means a uh, car, as in, you know, a uh, motor vehicle. And carro means cart, although in some places a motor vehicle is known by carro. So it depends on where you're from, which one you use. Uh, and also, yes, coach. Uh, coche could also be a coach. So it depends on like a stage coach. It depends where you are. Another one that was always my parents' favorite is the difference between ahora and ahorita. So in some places, ahora is the more immediate one. And in other places, ahorita is the more immediate one. My father is from Nicaragua. My mother was from Mexico. And they would communicate across each other. And one of them meant now and the other one meant later. And there would always be this funny comedy routine. So uh, I, I think we're running out of time. So Sajuna, please, let's do the closing. Yes. So these are the languages that are official languages of Alaska. I did not take the time to learn how to pronounce these properly. Um, but it is really cool that they are official. So, And I know that one of our members spoke uh, uh, some Yupik, I believe, um, but I might be misremembering. So that's, that's very fun and cool that we've got an Alaska indigenous uh, speaker with us today too. Um, and yeah, how cool would it be if other United States states recognized some other indigenous languages of theirs? So please do the attendance form to show that this was a good presentation and come to the next meeting on uh, the general meeting on Tuesday, uh, October 11th um, for LLN. And I'm putting the link in the chat to the other uh, Lunch and Learns that we're having. Uh, there's one each week between now and uh, mid-October. And thank you, everybody. I'm stopping the recording. It's been a pleasure being with you. And we hope to see you next week for our program with Alfredo Arreguin, who is a very well-known and famous and super talented uh, Pacific Northwest artists of Mexican descent. Thank you.